What's up, everyone? What I'm gonna do is uh, give it a couple of minutes for people to come on, and then I'll just give you a, a little bit of a breakdown about how I'm gonna go through the talk. Um, I'm gonna have to do some, some stuff with the camera because when I did a previous Instagram Live and I tried to have it in selfie mode and then show the text on the screen, it gets flipped. So for now, I can see everyone that's on the, on the chat and I can read questions and stuff like that. But once I go to the presentation, what I'm gonna have to do is flip the camera, okay? So if there are questions um, throughout the presentation, I would love to be able to tackle them during the presentation, but I'm not gonna be able to tackle them until the end uh, because I can't see the screen, okay? So what I'm gonna do is flip the camera, um, go through the presentation, and then I'll just flip it back to this and just tackle questions as we go, okay? So sit tight real quick. I'm gonna go get my laptop. I'm gonna unplug the, the lights just so there's no glare and then my computer we plugged in, not gonna run out of battery or anything like that, okay? And then we'll begin, so one second. If you want the full copy of this recording, um, if you want to see it again, if there's any questions that you want to ask me, it is going to be on, it's backwards, strengthcoachnetwork.com um, and let's crack on. Okay, so I'm just going to turn the camera around, I'm not going anywhere and then we'll start. Okie dokie. Give me, uh, give me a thumbs up and if, if everyone can see the writing the right way around. We're all good to go. Sweet. Okay, let me move this back. Cool. Okay. So, uh, what we're going to talk about now is an intermittent uh, shuttle based test for American football. Uh, that I devised in the first year of working with William & Mary Football uh, along with Eric Corum and Scott Kuhn and the, the presentation is basically going to be split into equal thirds of why you need to test, what you need to look for in testing, what makes a good test, what makes a bad test. Then the second third of this presentation is basically going to be an evaluation of what are the commonly used assessments for American football and we'll go into detail of why based on the criteria outlined in the first 20 or so minutes why really what gets traditionally used in American football is not very good at all and the last 20 minutes is going to be a breakdown of the tribe test which is our response to what we perceive to be a significant failing within testing in American football how it works, and then the future applications for how that test should look. So before you begin any conversation about which test is the best and why and how you're gonna improve testing, you have to ask yourself that first question, which is, why are you testing? And really, testing, you, you do to give yourself information that you didn't have before that is going to allow you to predict with a reasonable degree of confidence that something is going to happen in the future. Because if that is the case, it allows you to identify from all of the athletes that you have available who is going to perform best in the field of play. Which is important for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, is if you are you're recruiting talent from a pool, you want to be able to say with the greatest degree of accuracy who's going to be a performer and who's not so that you can take the limited amount of resources that you have and allocate them to those individuals that you've identified. Another reason is obviously that you, you want to infer 
with a reasonable degree of accuracy that the programming that you have used is going to have a positive impact on performance. Because ultimately, if it doesn't transfer to the sport, the improvement in the gym doesn't matter. We train in the gym, we train in the field to transfer to the sport itself and the, the, the skills and the movements executed on the field of play. And we also want tests wherever possible to steal from Brian Mann. We don't want a test that tells us what the athlete did because a lot of the time we use tests where we say, oh, you know, this guy squatted X amount of pounds or jumped X feet. What we typically do in a situation like that is we just pat ourselves on the back and keep doing what we were going to do anyway, which isn't really a super intelligent use of time because with, with very few exceptions, every coach has limited time to try and make their athletes better. So what's more informative is a test that tells you not just what they did, but why they did it. So it's a diagnostic test in nature that guides your decision-making process or allows you uh, or gives you information that you didn't have before to program with, rather than a test which tells you pretty much what you already knew. A lot of the time, you'll see guys that will you know, fly in training, the numbers keep improving. You know they are better. You don't need to dedicate an entire day of testing to find out what you already knew. So these are things that I think make for a good test. Now, if, if you boil it right down, what you are looking for in testing is correlation. Okay? Correlation is I affect one variable and I have a predictable outcome in another variable. Okay? We love to say in sports science and strength and conditioning, correlation and not causation. And it's very, very true. So for example, uh, ice cream sales are correlated with murders during the summer. So as ice cream sales go up, the, the rate of murders goes up in big cities. Does that mean that increasing ice cream sales is gonna result in more people dying? No. Does it mean if you go on a murdering spree, that ice cream sales are going to go up. There's obviously a hidden variable there, which is uh, temperature. So it's true. Correlation is not causation. However, by definition, the absence of correlation is the absence of causation. That is to say, if two variables are not linked together in a somewhat predictable fashion, there is no predictive value in that variable. And we've said at the very beginning, the reason that we're testing is we want to be able to predict a number of things about how that athlete is going to perform with a reasonable degree of certainty. So there must be a correlation between those two. And if there isn't, it's effectively a useless test. So for example, looking at how many languages can an athlete speak and how are they going to perform in the NFL, there would understandably be zero correlation between those two variables. So why would we waste our time investigating that because it doesn't have predictive value. Now, truthfully, there are a number of physical tests which have, in my experience, and I ran the numbers on my guys, zero predictive value. So from that perspective and that argument, they're a waste of time, other than to justify your existence as a strength coach and pat yourself on the back for training working. And we know training works without having to invest all that time. So correlation is the absolute foundation of effective testing for school. And that means you have to choose really, really wisely with what you're going to invest your limited time on. When we talk about correlation in the context of strength and conditioning sports science, we are basically talking about specificity. So if you read the work of Anatoly Bondarchuk, Yuri Verkashansky, a lot of that was grounded in does the outcome on the field of play or the sport result, because typically they investigate the stopwatch sports, can that be predicted by performance in a particular training exercise? And for exercises where there was a high degree of correlation, a high degree of predictive value, those exercises were considered more specific in nature. And for exercises which there was no predictive value, there was no correlation between the exercise and the outcome on the field, those exercises are considered general in nature. And we can go a little bit more into detail another time, but basically you can 
analyze the sport from three primary areas. One being the biodynamics, which is the movements that are most impactful to the outcome or done with the greatest of frequency and intensity on the field of play. The biomotor qualities, that is the force production qualities that underpin um, the expression of force within those specific movements. And then the bioenergetics, and that is the extent to which the three energy pathways contribute to the expression of force within those movement patterns. And we'll talk about how each of those gets affected. When you, if you, if you read Yuri Verkashansky dynamic correspondence, you can get really into the weeds uh, with this range of motion, regime of muscular work, where within the uh, range of motion peak force production occurs, muscles used, magnitude and direction of force, contact time available, angular velocity, and then maybe sensory information. But we're going to keep it real simple for today, just so we can have a, a general um, overview. But the more closely a test for American football is going to replicate the biodynamic, biomotor, and bioenergetic demands of the sport, the more likely it is that the body is going to be taxed in a way as it would in the field, the more likely it is that the test is going to be specific and correlated with the outcome on the field, and the more predictive value it has. So we are looking for a real close similarity between the sport and the test in order to have the greatest utility and the greatest predicted value. So, if we get to biodynamics first, I said that if you look at dynamic correspondence by Verkashansky, you can get extremely detailed in analysis of sporting movements. But it can be quite tricky to do it in field-based sports because if I'm a long jumper, there's only two things I have to do, the approach and the jump. If I'm a shot putter, I only have to um, throw, throw the shot. Ball. If I'm a sprinter, I only have one action. Or you can split it into start, drive, uh, top end speed, speed endurance. With field-based sports, it can be really, really difficult because it's a broad, unpredictable environment. Athletes are forced to perform a wide variety of skills and it can get confusing about well, what is specific and what isn't specific. But the truth is elite athletes tend to make their living based on doing one or two things to a world class level and then they're good or okay at everything else. If you are really good at the stuff that does not heavily uh, determine your performance in your position, you're going to suck. Uh, if you're not good at those two, one or two things, okay? So a good mental exercise to arrive at that answer is write down on a postcard what it is that you do better than anyone else or what the best person in the world in your position does better than anyone else. And the answer to that question is likely to be biodynamic SPP for your sport. And for the majority of field-based sports, the answer is going to be sprinting and dot, dot, dot. The dot, dot, dot is going to vary according to what your sport is, but with very, very few exceptions, namely the specialists in American football, they all need to be able to sprint, and we'll talk about why sprinting is so important in, in later sections. When we get to the biomotor qualities, it is true that all field sport athletes need all physical qualities to one degree or another, uh, just because, as I said, it's an unpredictable broad environment. So the more unpredictable the environment, the more robust and diverse the skill set has to be to respond to that unpredictable environment. When the event is highly predictable, highly controlled, the biomotor qualities that underpin performance are likely to be a lot narrower in nature and higher as well. But we can absolutely look at profiling elite athletes in the NFL combine and we can look at between the levels. So for example, uh, first round versus sixth round. We can look at power five versus group of five. We can look at FBS versus FCS football. We can look at college versus high school. And we can profile guys and say, okay, what are the physical qualities that seem to be most predictive of performance on the field of play? And are there any um, qualities that tend to separate between the groups? Um, it's going to upset a few people, but strength tends to be lower down the list. Typically, it's going to be speed for all but the linemen uh, and explosive power. 
Uh, that's not to say that strength isn't useful, but there tends to be more predictive value to speed and power outside of the bigs. And then of course, when you get to the bigs, strength is important, but only up to a point, and then you're probably looking at strength speed. But to a degree, they all need speed, power, strength, mobility, and coordination. And generally speaking, the closer they play to the snap, the more force they're gonna need because they're trying to overcome players of heavy mass. And it's more of a, how do you manipulate the other guy to be in a place where he doesn't want to be, rather than how do you find space and create separation or shut that down. The further from the snap, the more speed they need in order to be able to excel in their position, but they will need it to varying degrees. When you get to the bioenergetics, it's really difficult with bioenergetics because there's three pathways. They're always on at the same time. Uh, the extent to which they get used is going to vary as the duration of the play changes, as the uh, rest between play changes, uh, the pattern of activity changes throughout the play. And in truth, the research into bioenergetics <clears throat> can be quite misleading or quite limiting, especially when you do stuff like single fiber studies as opposed to looking at what are the actual metabolic demands placed in the athlete or their response to game-like activity. So rather than trying to measure three energy systems, which is costly and uh, expensive and maybe not the most applicable, it's probably more instructive to look at well, what are the time motion demands of the sport? Because if we can more easily define the average time motion demands of the sport, we can then work backwards and infer what the demands are likely to be on the metabolic system. So if you look at the research into FBS football, which is where most amount of data is available, what we actually see is that the average play duration is 5.2 seconds, plus or minus 1.7 seconds. Uh, typically, with a pass offense, you're going to see slightly longer plays. With a running offense, you're going to see slightly shorter plays. When you look at special team plays, they like to get up into the kind of 8, 9, 10 seconds, which I've excluded from this because, for the most part, the, uh, the number of plays is completely different. Um, we, we see that not all of that activity is going to be maximal because guys are inherently having to slow themselves down, think, react to the game, and then execute a skill, but it's about 5.2 seconds. We also see that the time between plays is going to be 36.1 seconds plus or minus 6.7. And obviously we have to consider the, the play clock. Some teams will play up tempo. Some teams will play huddle offense. It will be a little bit slower, but generally with a balanced offense, that is going to be the time uh, in game, out of game. And the number of plays is actually relatively limited. It's only going to be six plays per drive. We, we can talk about worst case scenarios in a second, but it's actually a lot less work than people think it is, and it's a lot more rest than people think it is. The idea that you have to play for 20 plays, have a minute rest, turn around and go again in another drive is just not representative of game demands. Uh, at the FBS level, especially because of um, breaks between quarters, half time, media timeouts, official timeouts, guys on average are getting over 10 minutes between drives. So they're having to be extremely powerful for very short bursts, they have to repeat that for about three, four minutes, and then they get over three times that in rest before they're asked to do it again. Now, does preparing you for the average case scenario prepare you for the worst case scenario? Not necessarily. Are we interested in how they perform in the worst case scenario? Of course we are, because you can make the argument that from a ta tactical, technical perspective, how athletes respond during the worst case scenario is likely to be more impactful to the outcome of the game than how they prepare for the typical case scenario. However, the counter to that is, if you are effective enough in the average case scenario relative to the opposition, you are likely to never find yourself in a worst case scenario. So you'll do so well under normal circumstances, you create such an unassailable lead, you're not gonna find yourself in, in that situation. However, with that said, yes, you are interested in uh, mentally, physically, tactically, technically, you want guys to push the envelope for that one occasion uh, or two occasions per season when they're pushing the go. So 
what we have to be mindful of is are we pushing guys to a scenario that isn't worst case, it's just never case. And if you actually look at the data, there's been one 20 play drive, uh, drive in the NFL this century. So the idea that we're gonna push out 20, 25, 30, 35 plays, uh, and we have to condition accordingly is just dumb, in my opinion. Um, the likelihood is that at college and at high school, that number of plays is gonna be even lower just because the level of athlete to not make mistakes that result in, in uh, dispossession within 20 plays is gonna be a lot less. So off the top of my head, the longest drive that I witnessed last football season was Kentucky, I believe it was against BT in a bowl game. It was 18 plays. And what we observed from our games is that typically the worst case scenario that we're gonna encounter in a game is gonna be 12 plays, which is typically gonna be a goal line to goal line drive. Um, you're getting three first downs within that, you're doing pretty good, okay? So to me, the typical worst case scenario that we're gonna encounter is gonna be 12 plays per drive. Now, you can make various arguments about, well, mentally they have to be able to get used to sensations of fatigue, worst case scenarios, and so on, but the, the science is fairly unequivocal, unequivocal on this, that 5.2 seconds is not gonna be sufficient for predominance of the glycolytic pathway. You are gonna be able to meet 5.2 seconds of match activity, some of it submaximal, 100% via the alactic pathway. Now, we know that 36 seconds is not going to be sufficient for 100% resynthesis of the alactic pathway. That's it's not going to recover completely. But 30 seconds is normally good for about 50% resynthesis after a, a maximal depletion or two volitional fatigue of the alactic pathway. So you're going to get back a decent amount of that alactic pathway. And you say, okay, in a typical six-play drive, are we really likely to completely deplete the alactic pathway where guys become so heavily reliant on the glycolytic pathway that it becomes glycolytic dominant? And the answer is, of course, no. It's going to be there in the background because those three pathways are always working, but the overwhelming likelihood is this, it's going to be a minor player and that the drive is going to be alactic, aerobic in nature. Those two pathways are going to be the primary driver. In a 12 play drive, worst case scenario, is it fair to say that a greater proportion of that energy contribution is going to come from the glycolytic pathway? Yes, it is. However, you have to look at the fact that there is going to be player substitution within that drive not all of those plays are going to be maximal. Uh, it's still going to be a limited contribution, and the biggest driver is going to be alactic aerobic. Now, if you if you take that time motion data and you want to dispute it, if you actually look at the research into repeat sprint ability with protocols that look somewhat like American football, typically five seconds on, 25 seconds off, repeated for a number of reps, the biggest predictor of absolute output from rep to rep is peak speed, which we're basically going to say is synonymous with the power of the alactic pathway. The next biggest predictor of repeat sprint ability is VO2 max, which we're going to say is representative of aerobic energy contribution. So if you look at the time motion data, if you look at the physiology, if you look at the applied research, football is alactic aerobic, don't that me. Okay, the idea that training the glycolytic pathway is physically optimal for football is a misnomer and is wrong. Now considering the biodynamics, the biomotor qualities and the bioenergetics, all of what we've looked at, we can say in conclusion that a good test for football should entail approximately five seconds of maximal activity. It's gonna entail 35 seconds of rest, six to 12 plays depending on what philosophy we're, we're adopting, and it's gonna heavily tax the movements and physical qualities that are most associated with the sport or position, okay? If you have any disagreements with that, feel free to leave me a comment, we can argue. So, usual suspects. If we look at the conditioning test that most football teams, football coaches are using to assess their athletes, it's typically gonna be 300 yard shuttles, one tens or half gases. And then we're gonna talk about the tribe test which was designed by us. 
So, if you consider this right here, keep that in your head. And now let's look at 300 yard shots. Okay, in a 300 yard shuttle, everybody runs the same distance. It might be 25 out and back a number of times, 50 out and back a number of times, 30 out and back a number of times, but everybody's gonna run the same distance. Everybody runs it in a different time. Does that sound like football? No. In football, everybody goes when the whistle blows, everybody stops when the whistle ends, and we're asking them to do a maximal output within reason during the duration of that football play. So one rep is gonna be 54 to 62 seconds. If you take the measuring standards that high profile teams in the NFL, high level college programs are using, that is what they're looking for. If we go back to 5.2 seconds plus or minus 1.7, that is a drive's worth of football under the worst case scenario in one rep of a test. To me, that is like asking guys to run a mile to predict how well they're gonna run 100 meters. The durations are so different that the energy pathways are gonna be taxed so differently that there is no predictive value uh, in trying to assess how powerful they're gonna be over five seconds. If you look at the changes of direction per rep, depending on which line that you run to, it's six to 10 changes of direction. And if you really watch a play, there's probably gonna be one, two, maximum of three explosive actions in one play. If you watched the, um, the Chiefs last year, Honey Badger, I think there was one extended play where he made maybe four or five explosive actions in one play, and people were losing their minds. The fact that they're losing their minds for four or five changes of direction or explosive actions tells you that in reality, we're really only expecting a couple of explosive actions max during a play. And six to 10 is just beyond the pale. So if you look at how these teams are implementing uh, a 300 yard shuttle test, it's a pass fail. It's a guy with a stopwatch going 40, uh, 54, 55, 62, 67, uh, sorry, 54, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and guys are just running through the line. So they're running, they're running, they're running, they see they're gonna make their time, and then they cruise, okay? There's two things wrong with that. One is that having a pass-fail test serves the assessment of fitness or preparation for sport like an IQ test that labels you smart or dumb. You don't wanna know smart or dumb, you wanna know how smart is he or she, how dumb is he or she, how much are they improving relative to where they were? Plus, if you have a test where guys are not stressing themselves maximally, i.e. sprinting as fast as possible, if the test is not maximal, you get no inference as to the athlete's capacity. It would just be like lifting a, a barbell of arbitrary load in the gym and saying, congratulations. You've not actually found out what the athlete's maximal strength is, so it doesn't serve. Look at one tenth. Same problem, okay? Same distance, different time, not full. 15 seconds for a good skill player. Good skill player, FCS, FBS football is probably gonna be somewhere between 10 and 11 meters per second Vmax. Uh, even if you account for uh, loss of start on the surface, 7.3 yards per second, which is a 110 over 15 seconds, is gonna be about 75% of max output. We just said, a test must be maximal in order for you to measure fitness. If it's not maximal, all you are doing is just measuring the, the ability of the athlete to survive the test. It doesn't tell you anything. It's also three times the duration of a typical football play. Not as bad as a 300, because it's a little bit less, but not maximal, so you're not measuring anything. I'll give you that if a 300 is maximal, you're measuring some kind of capacity my argument against that would just be you're measuring a capacity that is not predictive of their ability to play football given that the duration is so different. No explosive actions or changes in direction. That is one big biodynamic weakness of 110s relative to the demands of football. They have to be explosive, they have to be changing direction because that's what the sport entails. So not just from a time motion standpoint, from a biodynamic standpoint, the 110 is a weak test. Uh, if you look at a typical test, guys are going to be like, right, we're going to do 16 110s, 20 110s, whatever. Insert ridiculous number. 
you multiply that out, that's a game's worth of snaps in terms of the duration. Are we interested in an athlete's ability to perform a game's worth of duration in one go? Not at all, because what we're really concerned about is how explosive can they be? What can their total output be over those typical six to 12 plays that they're gonna be on the field? And then they get an outrageous rest of 12 minutes, which we can argue is sufficient for maximal or near maximal recovery. So they're just gonna do it again. So really, we're not interested in how well are they gonna execute the games with the plays in one go. We're interested in that one drive because they're gonna get a chance to recover and repeat that again and again. Half gases. Same problem, same distance, different time. 16 to 20 seconds. Is it maximal? Maybe, maybe at some schools. Typically though, you've got a guy with a stopwatch going 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Is it uh, maximal output? Well, if we've said that the sport of football is alactic, aerobic in nature, we want to be able to infer alactic power or alactic output when we get to an effort of 16 to 20 seconds duration, the average output of that effort is gonna drop just because the duration is so long. So really, we're not inferring maximal output in any meaningful way that would predict football performance. If the game is five to six seconds, I wanna test an effort that's five to six seconds to get an idea of their maximal output on the field. It's up to four times the duration of the average football play, which we've said is a weakness. It's got one explosive change of direction, that's the advantage of a half gasser relative to the other two tests. But again, 16 half gasses, which is not out, out of the question for a lot of football programs, is gonna be as high as 60 snaps of football. And you know, pass fail testing doesn't tell you what you already knew. The, the likelihood is you've trained your guys in preseason, you've lined them up, you know who's gonna be able to do it, you know who's not gonna be able to do it. Even if you've not seen them, you've given them the workout packet, you know who's done the packet, you know who's not done the packet. And then another issue is some guys are so talented that they're always going to be able to meet the demands of that test regardless of how much training or effort they put into it. And some guys are so bad that they're always going to struggle. And that situation can lead to a lot of loafing amongst the talented kids and it can lead to the less talented grinder kids like I used to be of you get discouraged and you don't have your work recognized. So if we take that criteria that we outlined a few slides ago, we say, right, five seconds of maximal activity, 35 seconds of rest, six to 12 efforts, is it movement specific? Is it physical quality specific? And what's the overall grade of that test? So 300s, fail on the duration, fail on the rest, because typically you're gonna have about three to five minutes between tests. Six to 12 efforts, fail. Most teams are gonna do two. Is it movement specific? Well, the output is sub-maximal because it's a minute, so the average output is going to drop. There's too much cutting, that's a fail. Does it measure the specific physical qualities that underpin the position? No, it doesn't. Now, the test that I'm going to propose to you later doesn't either, but across the board, that's a fail for 300s. One test. Five seconds of maxim maximal activity. No, it's sub-maximal and it's excessively long. Fail. 35 seconds of rest, fail. Typically, you're gonna look at maybe 45 plus seconds. It needs to come down, but in order for it to come down and be specific, this has to be maximal, it's not maximal, it's a fail. Six to 12 efforts, no, too many, fail. Movement specific, sub-maximal in nature, no cutting, fail. Uh, physical quality specific, also a fail, overall grade, fail. Half gases, too long. Fail, not enough rest again on the minute, 45 seconds. Um, fail, six to 12 efforts, fail. It's probably appropriate in terms of the amount of cutting, but because of the duration, as I said, the overall output is gonna drop. It doesn't give you a huge amount of predictability for a lactic output. Fail, fail, fail. So, one thing that I put on social media and I take the piss out of my, you know, my assistants, my interns, is when a flat's number. Your ratio of solutions offered to complaints made is one and flat's number. If your ratio exceeds, uh, sorry, if your ratio is less than one, you're an oxygen thief and we can't do business together. So I can shit on these tests all day long and say, well, this is not good, this is not good, this is not good. 
the onus is on me to offer a, a reply to that, what I think is going to be an improvement in order to try and uh, add a contribution and help other people out there. So the tribe test is my offering, our offering, to, uh, to get that number above one. And here is how it looks. I'm going to say a rude word here. I apologize. So whilst this is going on, you can see that we start on the goal line. Guys are required to sprint out to the 20 yard line as fast as possible. They're going to cut off one foot and then they're going to cover the maximal distance coming back this way. Okay, they have five seconds to cover as much distance as possible. These guys in the middle, they are measuring the distance that these guys cover on the way back. So for example, if I get to here, I perform 20 plus 10, 30 yards. In between, they have 25 seconds to recover between efforts. And when they come out again, they must cut off the other leg. So the leg changes every single rep. And what we are doing is recording the distance covered every single rep. And then we look at a few different numbers. But the big number that we look at is what is the total distance that they cover over 12 reps. That's our worst case scenario, goal line to goal line drive. So, we have to look at the test through the lens of principles. Is this a valid or is, is this a useful test? And we say, all right, what do we want from a test? One is, is it valid? Is there a correlation between performance in this test and performance in the sport? Uh, if there is, it has predictive value. If there isn't, it doesn't. Simplicity, is it idiot proof? Warren Buffett used to say, invest in a business that could be run by an idiot because sooner or later it will be. Same with testing, okay? You want an idiot-proof test because sooner or later you're gonna to have to test an idiot or your test is gonna be run by an idiot. Is it scalable? Can you test a bunch of guys at once? If you think about the extreme end of an exercise physiology lab, you may be able to do gas exchange ratios on a, a force plate treadmill, but you're only able to test one guy at a time. Do you want those constraints placed upon you when you are working with 80 to 100 football players? No. It gets really difficult the lower down you go, uh, less well-resourced colleges, high schools. It's typically going to be one to two coaches with an entire team full of guys. So it has to be scalable. Is the test, are the demands of the test the same every single time that you run it? Is it standardizable? Because if the demands of the test change, they're highly variable from rep to rep, or every time you test it, performance is going to go up and down, and you may attribute to uh, a change in performance, what is really just a change in the demands of the test. Is it reliable, i.e. how subject is that test to uh, external factors? Same reason, you want to see true change in performance rather than a change in the conditions of the test. And does it offer utility or resolution of data, i.e. does it give you information that you didn't have before, and to what extent does it guide the decision making process? That is the lens that we're evaluating the tribe test through, or that I, I try and evaluate testing through any test for use with athletes. So if we look at, is this test valid, and we look at bio, biodynamics. Is it true that athletes all sprint and change, to, uh, change direction to some degree? 100%. In an ideal world, for example, if we say, well, D linemen have to be able to uh, pass, rush, hand fight, and tackle, we would love to come up with a test that standardizes those movements and evaluates output in those movements. Same thing for linemen, we want a test that forces them to uh, block and move laterally. For uh, DBs, we want a test that forces them to maybe backpedal, change direction, sprint, jump, and all that kind of stuff. Problem is, it's really difficult to, uh, one, come up with a standardizable test for all of those different movements, Two, to have the resources to run it. Uh, it can be expensive and it can be less reliable because I'll talk about this in a second. When you're talking about something like contact, which is a major factor for a lot of positions, uh, guy, guys in the box, guys uh, in the line, 
it's inherently on it's inherently unstandardizable if that's a word. The conditions are always changing. You're dealing with a resistant human being. That's always going to be different from rep to rep. It becomes very, very difficult to standardize that. But it's true that all positions sprint and change direction to some degree, and we have to be willing to make a sacrifice in this stuff in order to have a test which is standardizable and is the lowest common denominator for all positions, which is sprinting and changing direction. It's going to be a little bit less applicable for the bigs because so much of what they do is lateral movement and uh, grappling type activities, but they still have to be able to run. If we look at the validity of biomotor qualities, does the test measure alactic power coordination to some extent? Yes, it does. Uh, does it measure the other qualities? So for example, isometric strength, maximal strength, strength speed, speed strength, elastic strength. No, it doesn't. Now, neither do the usual suspects, 300s, 110s, half gases. So to me, it's equal. And really, we're not, we're not trying to use a conditioning test uh, to assess those force production qualities. We're primarily interested in looking at bioenergetic preparation for the sport in the context of biodynamic movements that are specific to the sport. We have the ability to test those other qualities through sprinting, jumping, throwing, lifting, which is basically strength testing, typical gym-based testing. And to be honest, I don't think that we have a weakness within American football right now in our ability to test that stuff, so I'm not going to touch it. I think, for the most part, everyone does a good job with this. So this is, we're talking specifically about conditioning. Looking at time motion data, we set the tried test, five seconds on, 25 seconds off. It's a little bit shorter than 35 seconds rest for FBS balanced offense if you look at the research. However, our, our directive from the head coach coming in was we're going to play up tempo, we're going to snap the ball every 30 seconds. Uh, we decided on five on 25 off, one for that reason, and two, it's just a nice round number that fits into multiples of a minute. You can change that for your purposes if you want, but we go every 30 seconds for five seconds. 12 reps, it's double the average scenario. We said the average drive is six plays. Should we be trying to pursue a 12 play drive? Yes, because we're also interested in not just the average scenario, but the worst case scenario, because that's potentially more impactful. Uh, we want the players to get a little bit of a taste of the physical worst case scenario mentally as well. I think there's a very, very limited transfer of uh, the sensations of fatigue associated with starting to touch that glycolytic envelope and mental toughness on the field. But if there's a, if there's a percent, I'll take it. And you know, coaches want their athletes to have a little bit of fear with regard to fitness testing. They want the a little bit of suck. So that's, that's why we decided to make it 12 plays. But on the whole, you know, we believe the tribe test more accurately represents the biodynamic and bioenergetic demands of sport of football. It does a poor job of evaluating the biomotor qualities, but so do the other tests, and it doesn't really matter because you have other uh, perfectly fine and useful tests to, to measure that stuff. Simplicity, it's pretty simple. Stand on the goal line, on the buzzer, sprint out to the 20-yard line, back as fast as you can. Reason for the 20-yard line is, this test was adapted from uh, a repeat alactic sprint test, which requires athletes to run repeat efforts of seven seconds in a straight line. If you look at the speeds that they're getting up to with that, you look at the, the potential hamstring risk, that's too rich for my blood, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, we also wanted to add in a change of direction, so we're getting a little bit more specific to the, the biodynamic demands of football, so we made it 20 yards. The slowest big guy can get out to 20 and cover some distance on the way back. The fastest skilly is not going to be able to cover 40 yards in 5 seconds with the change of direction, so that's why we picked 20. You're covering as much distance as you can until the second buzzer, and that's when your spotter is going to note where you cross the line and write down your score. With the, the 25 second rest, you walk back to the goal line, turn around, wait for the next rep. You're cutting off a different foot every single rep. So you can start on the right, then you switch to the left, you can start on the left, switch to the right. 12 reps in total. In terms of equipment, it's extremely low budget. You're gonna need a field, 
cones to mark out the lines, pen, paper, clipboards, loudspeaker, just so the guys can hear it, smartphone, so you have an interval timer, and then basic math just to add up the numbers, that's it. In terms of the scalability, you already have lines on 0, 5, 10, 15, and 20 yards, and if you put a cone in between those lines just so you can measure where guys are coming across, that means you're gonna need 16 cones per line that you're gonna be testing. We run six lines at once, so we run sideline, hash, numbers on both sides of the field. That comes to 96 cones that we require. Uh, I ran the numbers, I think you can get 100 cones for about 10 bucks, so you can test um, for less than 10 bucks. We run two players per line, so if I have, if we go back, you can see these cones here, you can see guys are running either side of that line. So although we need six lines of cones, we are actually running 12 guys at once. So we can run 12 guys at this test at once with spotters. We run three groups at once. One group's running a test. One group is spotting in the middle, and one group is warming up. We allot 10 minutes per group. That's six minutes to run the test and a four minute transition. So typically maybe two minutes on the front end to distribute the clipboards, to explain the test, answer any questions, let the guys get ready, have a drink, get themselves mentally ready, and then a two, two minute transition on the other end whilst we uh, scoop them up off the floor and uh, get the next group ready. That works out to 72 players per hour on one end of the field. If you're really brave and you wanna run two ends of the field, you have enough interns, enough cones, enough clipboards, you can run 144 players in an hour. Okay, which is, in my opinion, highly efficient, and it's a better test than what is available. Okay, I'm going to uh, plug this in real quick just so I get a little bit more power. Okay. So, in terms of standardization, the test is obviously going to be the same every single time. Every field is 100 yards, every smartphone is the same, so the actual uh, setup of the test is not going to change. If you're on a field and you, if you have a smartphone, the test is going to be exactly the same every single time. In terms of the reliability, the obvious weakness of this test is going to be the human factor. What happens if I see he got to the 11 yard line, the other guy sees that he got to the 10 yard line, that's when the error starts to come in. But anecdotally, the biggest difference we've ever seen between testers is one yard. So. If we extrapolate that one error and we assume, right, this guy's gonna be terrible, he's gonna get every single rep wrong, and we do 12, 12 yards difference, it works out to about a 3.3% difference between raters, so like an inter-rater reliability. Is that significant? I don't know. Maybe, but we need to, we need to do some future studies into inter-rater reliability to look at what is the smallest worthwhile change compared to the standard error and what's the threshold at which we start to see an error where we're really not seeing meaningful change, we're just seeing error. Um, is that a weakness? Yes, it is a weakness. Is it uh, specific to the tri test? No, because I've never seen an inter-rater reliability study or looking at smallest worthwhile change or standard error for the usual suspect test. So again, in my opinion, it's a draw, and because of the the aforementioned strengths of the tribe test, I'm still going to use a tribe test. Looking at reliability, Alex Natera did great research in Aussie Rules Football about the impact of temperature on yo yo test performance. When the weather gets warmer, you're basically good for a level improvement that has nothing to do with training. So, obviously, factors like temperature, humidity, wind, precipitation, psychological drive. If you've got guys that know they're gonna get cut or they're trying to win a jersey or research shows, if there are women around, they are gonna drive themselves much harder to uh, perform at this test. Now, this test is like any other, it's gonna be subject to those, those factors, but for the most part, this top line here, we can get rid of with an indoor facility. So if you have access to an indoor, I would advise you to do it in an indoor uh, for those reasons and the fact that when you do so, you are standardizing the surface quality as well. You don't want to be doing this 
on uh, grass or turf that can get greasy or soft when the weather gets bad. However, no test is perfect and you're going to have to go to war with the army that you have. Those conditions are what they are. You're going to have to do your best to test for the conditions that you have. What you don't want to do is get into this trap of looking at changes in test performance and attributing them 100% to a lack of fitness or laziness or something like that. You have to, you have to consider the fact maybe I'm going to be wrong here. Okay, I'll give you a real example from my career in Japan. We had run a test that was not the one that I wanted to do. The coach had said, right, we're going to do a one kilometer test, which was 10 lengths of the field, back to back to back to back. And I had a guy that in the summer, he had smoked it. We ran the same fitness test in season at the coach's behest, and the guy's 10 seconds slower than he was um, in the season. And this coach said to me, explain yourself. Like I was literally dragged to the office, I had to explain myself. Why is he 10 seconds slow? Well, he's asthmatic, he's a smoker, he's got a sore ankle, it's in the winter, the ground is softer, all these different factors. Are we really surprised that he's less than 10% slower on every single rep? He's only losing one second per 100 meter rep in the field. Is that a big difference? No, not really. And you have to kind of take that on the chin. So in terms of utility or resolution of data, pass-fail testing sucks, okay? It's as useful as a barbell of arbitrary load, strong, not strong, no. When you test strength, you wanna know what's his maximum, what did it used to be, how has the program worked, how's he gonna progress, how do we rank the athletes from top to bottom? So we don't want testing, which is gonna encourage loafing uh, in the talented kids, and we also don't want testing that is gonna discourage other kids because some of these 300s, 110s, half gases, you're just gonna get some guys that are so talented, they're just gonna loaf. If our test is gonna make people suffer, we want people to suffer across the board because it's maximal for everyone. So this binary data doesn't give you the insight that serial data does. Pass, fail, it doesn't tell you anything. Testing, he was this, now he's this, he's made this much improvement over X amount of time, that's more informative to your practice than a pass, fail test. How much actionable information does a pass-fail test give you? The answer is not much. Uh, it's really just gonna tell you that they survived the test and that's it. And most of the time what happens is you pat yourself on the back, oh, you're fit, you're fit, you're not, you're lazy, and then you're gonna do what you're gonna do anyway. The tribe test gives you three different pieces of information. We're looking at the peak score, which is what is the greatest distance that you can cover in your freshest state, which is six, uh, five seconds. So. Going out to the 20, how much ground can you cover on the way back? The best I think we've ever seen is 34 yards, which is really moving. The total score, we're gonna add up over those 12 reps what your total distance was so that we can get um, an inference as to the total output or capacity of all three energy systems. Our current record is 387. What we typically look for is 300 for the bigs, 330 for mids, and 360 for the skillies. But to be honest, we're probably gonna have to raise those numbers just because we're having so many guys that do it. When we first ran the test, I believe we had one guy over 360. Um, now, I think we have 12 players over 360, so the guys are really coming along. In terms of the peak score, we're kind of using that as uh, an inference for alactic power. With this information, you can compare between individuals. You can track one individual you can also infer training needs. If I have a guy that absolutely smokes the, the peak score, so in five seconds he can cover 34 yards, we know he's pretty explosive and he's got a good change of direction. If we have a guy that's, that has a blazing 40 but then sucks in this, the chances are that the efficiency or the strength qualities to effectively decelerate and re-accelerate in another direction just aren't there. Likewise, if we have guys that have blazing straight line speed for one effort and then they drop off a cliff because this fatigue decrement, which is uh, worst divided by best multiplied by 100, we're looking at that percentage drop. If you have extremely high peak score and a big decrement, that suggests to us that you are heavily anaerobic in how you meet those demands, that you might benefit from blocks where we concentrate on your weaknesses of more aerobic focused work. If we flip it and we say, okay, well this kid's got a really good or 
okay score with an incredibly low fatigue decrement, but the peak is a little bit lacking, that may be an athlete who is heavily aerobic in how they meet the demands of that test, and we may want to prescribe a little bit more alactic power work, sprinting work, and so on. So the test gives you more utility than a 300, 110, or half gas test, because with that, you're saying, right, not fit enough, fit enough. It doesn't actually tell you where, or it doesn't allow you to infer, based on your experience, where that weakness might be. Weaknesses of the test, no contact. If contact is a massive part of a lot of positions, linemen, linebackers, safeties, it would be great to be able to have some kind of tackling, breaking tackle, blocking, hand fighting demand to this test. Because we've said whatever you do better than anyone else, that's what you need to be measuring. Problem is, is how do you standardize for something that is inherently unstandardizable? I'm reacting to you, I'm trying to manipulate my body to stop you putting me where I don't want to be. You can't standardize for that. There's a lot of sensory information going on. Uh, we're dealing with a lot of awkward loads. And it would be great to come up with a test that has more accurate representation of the biodynamics, biomotor qualities, and bioenergetic demands of contact. But no two reps are alike. So we've kind of run through this exercise in our head to say, right, how would we do it? What would it look like for the bigs, for example? One thing we said is, well, add load, decrease velocity. So we could use a sled. Well, that's great, but cost, because now we're going to need 12 sleds. Surface, it gets harder or easier based on how hot or how greasy it is. If you speak to Kurt Hester at Louisiana Tech, it gets so hot in Louisiana that the rubber pellets on the turf melt, so we can't standardize that. The test gets harder or easier based on where your hands are on the sled or between manufacturers of the sled. So if you want to measure yourself against guys at another school or compare with other teams of data, you can't do that. You can say, okay, well, we're going to do it with a non-motorized treadmill. We're going to do it with uh, a woodway treadmill with force plates in it. Well, all of a sudden, we start to get to a scalability issue where you're back to your exercise physiology lab trying to run 80 guys through one test that takes 15 to 20 minutes to set up. That is not applicable for all the professional teams where you're probably looking at a, a, a rehab scenario at best. So if anyone has... Any advice on future stuff for uh, for the tri test or in relation to that? Please do let me know. This is my email. You can contact me via here. This is going to be on strengthcoachnetwork.com. This is going to be the only place where you can get a recording of uh, of this presentation. And if you go on Instagram, obviously Strength Coach Network. Uh, Strength Coach Network. I will come to questions in a second. Strength Coach Network, uh, if you want to DM me, you can get 50% off your first month. We have over 200 hours of lectures. We have a discussion forum where you can ask me questions, speak to other coaches. We have a career development forum. We have a section on the business of coaching. And basically, what we're trying to do is help coaches build the career that they want. It's what I wish I had when I was coming up. So you can, uh, you can contact me for that. So right, I'm just going to turn it around again, and then we can ask the questions. Okay, all right, let's answer some questions. Okay. Uh, what were the resting that was used? 25 seconds. Uh, how specific is the distance recorded after the turn to the yard, fraction of a yard? It's to the yard just because uh, it's simple to do, uh, as Scott said, tell the boys to mark where the foot lands, you hear the second buzzer um, to the nearest yard, you circle it on the piece of paper, and you just go down and add it up. Um, via my strength. Do you do video cross check? Turn over the line. Yes, we do. We have our snitch division. Apparently, it says I've got 20 seconds remaining here, so what I'm going to do. When this runs out, I'm going to start up another um, IG Live and you guys can follow. Uh, but yes, we have snitches. If they're egregious, we take a yard off. Uh, one of the times of the year that we use the tribe.